can I'm so happy that I can share with you our great traditions. And these are very important today at a time when we are battling problems like climate change. And if we could just go back to our tradition, I think the problem of climate change can also be addressed. I think there's some light on the left. I'll just switch it off. So, um, you know, over the, over the millennia, past so many millennia, 5,000 years, and I will show you why it's 5,000 years, then we can say it. Um, we have protected the environment. We have protected it with our culture, our traditions. And it is only now, with the loss of it, I would say in the last, last few hundred years, that we have gone to a different lifestyle, a different way of life where we are not protecting it. So may I have the slides, please? Uh, you, you, you have to share that again. Okay. okay. Share screen. the sacred ecology, the sacred ecology of India. The ecology, the environment was regarded as sacred. And how did we protect it? Now, this is traditional Indian environmental management. Today we talk we have PhDs in environmental management, but it was always there in our culture. Now, the Indian housewife starts her day with a prayer for peace in her environment. How does she do it? She decorates the floor outside the entrance to her home with kolam or alpan, kolam in South India, alpana in Bengal, rangoli in Maharashtra and North India. But importantly, it's made of rice flour. And with this, she feeds the ants, ants. So she does not have to use pesticides to keep out ants and insects. She's feeding them, so they're busy there. And I can see it in my own house. I don't have any pest control. I just have this rice flower column. And the insects are finish it off by evening. By evening, there's hardly any column left. In the center house, all throughout India, we have this tradition of an open central courtyard. And it's not just today. Even in the Indus Valley culture, 3000 BC, you can see open courtyards. You can see what is probably where the Tulasi was kept. And the housewife uh, waters it every day. It's a medicinal plant that prevents coughs, colds, fevers, because that is what leads to everything difficult in our lives, including COVID, I'm afraid. Then she circumambulates the pipal tree. Now, this is something that the whole of India shares. From Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from west to east, I saw it in the east also. Uh, rich, this is a ritual binding all our civilizations, the Indus, the Vedic, the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain tradition. Now, what is so important about the people? You can also go around a coconut tree. But the people, unlike the coconut, which releases oxygen only at night and all the other plants, the uh, people releases oxygen day and night, 24 hours. That is why our great sannyasis, the Buddha, sat under a people tree because he got oxygen, which may gave him uh, which made, made it possible for his brain to function and for him to think. She prays that her bath water may be as sacred as the river Ganga. Now, the river Ganga has proven antimicrobial properties. This does not happen in other rivers. And uh, so, whether she's, whichever part of India she is, she says, Gangecha Yamani Chaiva Godavari Saraswati Narmade Sindhu Kaveri Jale Asmin Sanmigin Kuru. So she uh, prays that the water that she bathes in is a sake, will become as sacred, meaning as, uh, as much of a preventative as the Ganga is. She feeds the crows in memory of her ancestors. Now, the crows are the greatest scavengers. They keep the outer environment of the house clean. So we did it in the name of religion, in the name of tradition, but these were all 
examples of traditional environmental forms of management. Now, every aspect of our life is intimately connected to nature and the environment and scientific environmental management and carried out in the name of religion. Unfortunately, all that was good and preserved in the name of culture and tradition has been discarded in the name of modernization and development. And I would really put it to the British period because even during uh, Islamic rule and Mughal rule, in the villages, the women continued their way of life. Of course, in the cities uh, that would have gone. But it is when the British came that they took away ownership even of the village pond. However, many of our environmental traditions are still preserved in rural India. And it's amazing how common these traditions are from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Dwarka to Dibrugar. And when I say that, I can say from what I saw, because I was recently in Dwarka and recently in Assam, and I saw the same environmental traditions everywhere. Environmental protection is a dharma, the law of righteousness. The basis of Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain culture is dharma, or righteousness, incorporating duty, cosmic law, and justice. It is sanatana or internal, for it is without beginning or end, and it supports the whole universe. Every person must act for the general welfare of the earth, humanity, all creation and all aspects of life. Dharma is meant for the well-being of all living creatures, hence that by which, which the welfare of li living creatures is sustained, that for sure is dharma, says the Mahabharata. So the sacred ecology of India, the traditions of India, are thus appropriately placed to take on contemporary concerns like deforestation, water shortage, intensive farming of animals, and global warming. All these are causing climate change. Now let's see, it begins in the Indus civilization. The first scene of worship in India is this scene where a male figure, maybe is a yaksha, standing, stands inside a stylized people tree with a kneeling worshipper in front. And the seven men below could be the Sapta Rishi, Rishi, known in English as the Big Dipper. This is the oldest scene of worship in Indian archaeology and art. And the tree was the object of worship. The worship of the tree continues today. Now, in the Vedas, people and sh the in the Vedas, the people and the Shami twigs were rubbed against each other to produce the sacred fire to produce Agni. Later, the Kajali becomes the sacred tree of the Bishnois under Guru Jamboji of Rajasthan. Now, the Tamil text Tolkapya mentions that Kotrave or Durga was the goddess of the desert. Surprising how he knew it because. There are no deserts in Tamil Nadu. And the prickly Kotran plant or Kejarli was her plant. And she is called Kotrave after the plant. Her vehicle is the tiger. So you can see that even that, that, that early, you have the association of the goddess with the tree. And with a tree which is meant for the desert. And this was probably the time when River Saraswati went underground and Rajasthan became a desert. Thus a major ecological event is remember, remembered through religious associations. The sages of the Rig Veda show a clear appreciation of the natural world and its ecology, the importance of the environment and the management of natural resources. The Rig Veda dedicates a whole hymn to the rivers, the Nadi Stuti Sukta. And the Prithvi Sukta of the Atharva Veda consists of 63 stanzas in praise of Mother, Mother Earth and Nature and human dependence on the Earth. It's amazing what the Atharva Veda says. And the Brihadaryana Upanishad says, In the beginning there was the self alone. He transformed himself into man and woman. Later he transformed himself into other creatures bipeds and quadrupeds. In this way, he created everything that exists on earth, in water and sky. 
he realized i indeed am creation for i produced all this now this is actually though it sounds like a creation him with god and man separate it's not because it says the self transformed himself he did not create man and woman and other creatures so he is within every human being he is a part of every aspect of creation human plant and animal so this is the ultimate in vedanta the bhagavad gita krishna says i am the earth i am the water i am the air the environment is sacred because it is the supreme being himself in the vedas nature was part of an indivisible life force uniting the world of humans animals and plants natural phenomena express the principles that govern the world and the cosmic order or rita prakriti means placing the four of first the original or natural form or condition of everything the original or primary substance it's come to mean nature and while purusha is the masculine aspect prakriti who is also shakti is the feminine prakriti is dynamic causing change the primal motive force an essential part of the universe and the basis of all creation hinduism has a definite code of environmental ethics humans cannot consider themselves above nature nor can they claim to rule over other forms of nature hence traditionally the hindu attitude has been very respectful towards nature now the primordial or cosmic matter of nature is made up of five elements the prithvi vayu agni apa and akasha that is earth air fire water and space better known as the pancha mahabhuta their proper balance and harmony are essential for the well being of human kind and maintenance of this harmony is a dharma or religious du- or righteous duty now we see biological diversity in the family of lord shiva himself here this is a painting of shiva parvati two sons kartikeya and ganesha and the much loved elephant headed deity who is ganesha now shiva's habitat is mount kailas with its snowy peaks representing the cosmic heavens the stream of ganga water from the hair of shiva's head indicates the purity and importance of water nandi the bull represents animals who help humans domestic animals help human beings without the bull we would not have had any transportation any we could not have discovered the ability to produce food because it pulls the plow and durga's lion represents wildlife the peacock a peacock represents the avian species the mouse and serpent represent small and hidden animals in shiva's household natural enemies live in harmony with each other that is the message we should take and the family of lord shiva represents the coexistence of all and is influenced by the concept of ecological harmony and respect for biological diversity now let's come to the other indian traditions jainism says all life is interdependent parasparo parasparo pa graho jiva na and sahimsa or non violence towards all is the supreme virtue you know we only see ahimsa in terms of animals but jainism also talks about ahimsa for plants that is why they do not eat certain plants jainism says the earth is our dwelling our temple our vessel in which spiritual attainment can be perfected as all life is interconnected mutual coexistence is the mantra for sustainable living now this is the jain philosophy buddhism says the entire world should be protected and the, the entire world though apparently divided is undivided in its interconnection buddhism sees nature as part of a continuum of interbeing and buddha attained enter enlightenment as i had mentioned earlier seated under a peepal tree in urvela forest 
He gave his first sermon in the deer park at Sagar. Hence, trees, forests, and gardens become sacred. In Tamil literature, we have a description of the Aindatine, the five-fold division of the geographical landscape, each with its own flowers, trees, animals, plants, and deity. I'm not going into the detail of each Thine, but I will just mention that the forests were presided over by Kartikeya or Murugan. The Mullai, the, the reigning deity of the pasture land was Krishna. Agricultural lands were ruled by Indra. The coastal regions belonged to Varuna. And the wasteland or desert was the region of goddess Kotrave or Durga. Because that is when the Saraswati disappeared and vast deserts came into being in northwestern India. Now the sacred ecology continues today. And let us see how this continues. Forests. Now, in ancient India, there was a close symbi symbiotic relationship between people and nature. The country was thickly forested. Forests were places of retreat, a source of inspiration. For all Vedic literature was revealed in the forests. The Aranyakas are philosophical speculations and it means produced by or relating to the forest or belonging to the forest. They were composed by sages living in the forest who said that the forest gave them the inspiration. And one of the most beautiful hymns of the Rig Veda is dedicated to Aranyani, the goddess of the forest. We never hear Aranyani in later Sanskrit literature. And I've never even heard a person with the name uh, Aranyani. Yet her spirit pervades later goddesses of Hinduism, like Prakriti, who the earth goddess, Bhu Devi, Annapurna, Amman in Tamil Nadu, Bon Bibi in Bengal, who is also worshipped by Muslims living there. And there were three categories of forests in the Vedas. The Tapovana was a refuge for meditation. The kings and commoners saw, sought the guidance of the sages who lived in the Tapovan. The Mahavan was the great forest in which all species could find refuge. And the Shrivan was the forest. So Mahavan was where the wildlife it was kept aside. You have to read Kautilya, his Artha Shastra, to see the beautiful division of forests. The Shrivana was the forest which provided prosperity because people also needed timber for other reasons, the fruits and so on. So the Shrivana was maintained by the temples and the king and set ex aside exclusively for utilization. Rama's journey from Ayodhya to Lanka was through forests. Ramayana is a botanist's delight with detailed descriptions of forest types and the plants that grew there. Rama stays in four different forests during his exile. Chitrakuta, a deciduous forest. Dandakaranya, which is near Bhimbetka. Even today it is a uh, thick forest. Panchavati is a tropical dry, dry deciduous forest and the Panchavata are still maintained near Nasik and Kishkinda is a dry and moist deciduous forest and this is so described in the Ramayana. Of course, they don't use words like deciduous and so on. The Aushadi mountain is mentioned as situated in the Trans-Himalayan region with alpine plants. Even today, the Dalai Lama insists that for Tibetan medicine, people must go to the foothills, people must walk up the mountains and collect the uh, various herbs. I actually saw it and I saw them being made into medicine. And finally, of course, we have the evergreen tropical forests of Lanka. The Arthashastra talks about various types of forest uses. Mrigavana, Dravyavana, which are economic forests, Pakshivana, Pashuvana, Vyalavana, reserved for tigers and wild animals, and Hastivana, a sanctuary for elephants. And Dravyavana was a source of forest produce. Interestingly, deforestation and tree, illicit tree felling was punishable by levies and fines. 
ecological balance was maintained by the appointment of forest managers and protection of different species of animals was a duty of the state. These laws were followed till the 7th, 8th century. And then everything was destroyed. But it continues in villages of India. Tapovan lives on in the sacred groves. Now, what are these sacred groves? Do you know that every village in India, all over India, still has a sacred grove? It is the home of local flora and fauna. It's a mini biosphere reserve. It has unique forms of biodiversity conservation, whereby religion and tradition are used to conserve the ecology as a natural heritage. So there are laws that if you cut a tree or if you even take a branch, you have to feed the whole village for a day or two days, depending on the enormity of your transgression. It, was an, it is an area of conservation as well as a spiritual retreat because the grove belonged to the mother goddess. And this is the single most important natural heritage of the ancient culture of India. This tradition goes back to food gathering societies who venerated nature and natural resources. Their significant reservoirs of biodiversity, conserving unique species of plants, insects, and animals. I've even, earlier we were talking about Meerut. I have seen sacred groves near Meerut where uh, plants are being conserved. And so far, we have uh, documented the work in the tr traditions in uh, 15 of the Indian states. This year, we've taken up Sikkim. Our work got stalled for three years because of the COVID lockdown that we have resumed. And just this week, we have been collecting the work of the traditions of Sikkim. Now, these groves are dedicated to the mother goddess, occasionally to a male god, but it belongs to the mother goddess, who is the source of all fertility. Now, what is its ecological significance? One is conservation of biodiversity. Second is recharge of aquifers. The groves are associated with ponds, greens, uh, streams and springs, which support the water requirements of local people. Yamuna, Yamuna, Ganga are all elsewhere. But in local villages, they depend on the local pond. And these, there's always a pond in the sacred grove. And that water maintains the water level of the village. Vegetative cover helps in recharging aquifers. And soil conservation, the vegetation cover of the sacred groves improves the soil stability of the area and prevent soil erosion. And many this tradition continues today. Many villages in India are still named after plants and animals. Like Vrindavan is named after the Vrinda or Tulsi plant. And Mailapur in Chennai after the peacock or Mail. So the degree of sanctity varies. In some forests, even dry foliage and pollen fruits are untouched. And they say that any disturbance will offend the local deity, cause disease, calamities, or failure of crops. It's mainly to prevent people. The Garos and Khasi tribes of Northeast India. Northeast India has the most wonderful sacred groves. They prohibit any human interference in these groves. In some places, dead wood or dried leaves may be picked up to cook only the prasad during a festival. But live tree and its branches can never be cut. The Gonds of central India prohibit the cutting of a tree, but they allow foreign fallen plants to be used. It's amazing that even children are not permitted to urinate in a sacred grove out of respect for and in fear of the deities within. I have actually seen this because we went to a village where, uh, I, where some of the children wanted to go and the mother actually beat them up and made them run out of the grove. And I saw this not just in India, even in Japan, they have sacred groves and they have uh, toilets outside the grove so that you can use and then you go and walk, rest, uh, and then come back. No, In a sacred grove, nobody can do anything. And medicinal plants are preserved in the sacred grove. 
That is their big contribution. They could be accessed during an illness, disease, and so on. And they were the pharmacies of ancient India, rural India still. So they belong to the mother goddess. And what do people do? They gift terracotta animals, generally the horse, as because they believe that she needs the horse. And this uh, tradition of gifting horses to the mother goddesses is again all India. I've seen it in South India. You have the INR horses. I've seen it in Bengal where you have the Bankura horses. This is a tradition all over India in villages. We would not expect to have communication. A village in South India and a village in North India would not have had com communication. But we all have this tradition of gifting a terracotta horse to the goddess of the groom. So they, the gods can be grouped under rain, fertility, protectors, hero stones, snake stones. And many of them belong to Kali also. Just some pictures to show you what a sacred grove looks like. So we have documented 10, over 10,000 sacred grove, groves. We have restored 53 groves in Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. We have aided an NGO in Rajasthan to restore the Orans. Orans are the descendants of the Aranyas, where the Aranyakas were written. So the Orans are probably the most uh, uh, traditionally documented sacred groves of India. We created a new grove because we, uh, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan said, you have restored so many. He said, create one. So we created one next to a little... Uh, temple of a goddess and you have to go to a sacred grove. It is so magical with it. And wildlife has returned to many groves. The water table is maintained. We prepared a sacred grove management plan for the government of Tamil Nadu and an ecosystem service assessment for the Ministry of Environment and Forest Government of India. We did an ecological study of sacred groves in five ag agroclimatic zones for the government of Tamil Nadu. We influenced the Kerala government to, to give 10,000 rupees per kavu. Of course, in Kerala, of course, everything is very small because the uh, number of people are too many and the land is small. They are called sarpa kavu and each house used to have its kavu. So they give 10,000 for the maintenance of the kavu and we produced a film. We drafted a national policy also. Now the distribution of sacred groves you can see, but what are the uh, problems? Disappearing traditional belief systems. Nobody wants to believe that a goddess in the grove is so important to their lives. Urbanization, developmental activities and encroachment. There was a beautiful grove just outside Pondicherry they built a road right through it and destroyed so many trees. Changing forms of worship. In many groves now, they want big temples. That little shrine to Devi is not enough. Religious conversions. This is a big problem in the Northeast, which, as you know, is very Christian. And in a state like Andhra Pradesh, which is uh, seeing heavy re religious conversion, and the first thing they do is forget the baby in the grove and stop looking after the grove. Then, of course, you have problems like invasion of exotic species and pressures due to increasing livestock and fuel wood collection. See, in the past, people did not permit their livestock to enter the groves. That's why, but once you don't believe in this traditional system, you can do anything. Now, just as we have sacred groves, we also have a tradition of Nandavanam or sacred gardens, which were maintained to produce, provide flowers for the temple ritual. And they are places for meditation and healing and fruits and flowering plants. In sacred groves, you don't have commercial species. In the Nandavanam, you do. You have fruit and flowering plants because they are used for the temple. And an example is Madurai Kavi, Nandanam in Sri Rangam, Tirumala, Orissa, Vrindavan, so many others I could go on. 
Now, what are the type of gardens? The Nandavanam attached to Hindu temples to provide flowers for the rituals. The Buddhist gardens, a place for meditation and healing. Monasteries in India still have beautiful gardens attached to them. Then we have the tradition of the Bag or Bagicha, which are ethno silvi horticultural gardens, traditionally planted near, near tanks, settlements, or amid forests in North India. And the biodiversity mainly consists of utility trees, such as mangoes and so on. But green felling is totally banned in these gardens. Now, from sake, the next form I'm going to tell you about, where I spoke about the groves and the gardens. Now, we have the sacred plants. What were these? You see a saw tree worship on the inner seas and the worship of the Tulsi and rice, which is worshipped as goddess Annapurna. So what are these thalavrikshas which we see in every temple? Thalavrikshas are the trees that first shelter the deity beneath the sky. Later, they were replaced by temples. Temples came much later. That's why we don't see very early temples in any part of India. The deity was sheltered beneath the tree. And the sacred tree later became secondary after the temple was built and it was worshipped as the Sthalavriksha of the temple. I have seen this in many parts of South India. For example, a very famous temple in the South called Vaidishwaran. Vaidya Kai Ishwara. Ishwar. So it's Shiva as the great uh, medicinal god or the great doctor. The original lingam is still there at the back under a neem tree. Actually, Shiva's tree is the bilvam. But in this temple, it is the neem because that is the medicinal plant. And the Cholas built a huge lingam and a huge temple. And it's very impressive. But the old lingam is still there under the neem tree. So why are plants sacred? Because there is a close association with the deity. Bilva is associated with Shiva, the Neem with the goddess, Devi, Tulsi with Krishna. They shelter an object of worship. Some plants are believed to have originated from the gods themselves. For example, the flame of the forest, that is the Palasha, is believed to have originated from the body of Brahma and the Rudraksha from the tears of Lord Shiva. Some plants became sacred through what might have occurred in their proximity, like pipal tree in Buddhism. Although pipal tree has been sacred from time immemorial, in Buddhism it is sacred because Gautama Buddha attained enlightenment beneath the tree. And plants, of course, with an important social or economic or major ecological role are considered sacred, like the kejar leaf is considered sacred by the Bishnois of Rajasthan because it is so crucial to de desert ecology. It provides the community with food, fodder, and building material. Where I live in Chennai, uh, there is a temple in Mailapur, that is the city of Peacocks, a temple of Lord Shiva. The sacred tree, tree there is not the Bilva, it is the Alexandrian laurel or punne. And why? Because Mailapur was once a great port and the wood, the timber of the punne was used to build ships. So ancient Indian knew, Indians knew about the ecological value of plants, medicinal value, economic value. And so they protected the plants by calling them sacred. They also knew about pollution and Kautilya's Arthashastra says, Punish, punishment should be awarded to those who throw dust and muddy water on the roads. A person who throws inside the city the carcass of animals, throws garbage, must be punished. Now, I wish we followed Kautilya, Kautilya's uh, admonitions. Environmental Vikriti was, in, was identified several millennia ago. From pollution, two types of diseases occur in human beings, says the Mahabharata. The first is related to the body and the other to the mind, both of which are interrelated. So when they're balanced in the body, it is free from, from disease. 
and Charaka was prescient when he predict predicted. Due to pollution of weather, several types of diseases will come up and they will ruin the country. Therefore, collect the medicinal plants before the beginning of terrible diseases and change in the nature of the earth. Then I come to the water. So I've, we've covered the sacred groves, the sacred gardens and the sacred plants. And of course, our, our traditional attitude towards pollution. Now, water and water bodies have always been held sacred. I don't have to tell you how important waters are. And most Indian rivers are believed to be divine manifestations. Rivers have been given a divine status. Ganga is a goddess. Yamuna is a goddess. And in all the early temples of Mathura, you will see them flanking either side of every of the door. And some, of course, are male. And polluting water is a great sin, according to Sanskrit texts. So all our rivers are sacred. The Sapta Sindhavi, Nadi Stuti Sutta of the river, of the Rig Veda, the um, prayer to the rivers, identifying local rivers with Ganga. Waters are the foundation of this universe, says the Vedas, and so it is worshipped. They appear as deities with an animal vehicle. Ganga writes the crocodile, Yamuna has the tortoise. And each has an origin myth to establish her sanctity. All the pilgrimage sites are found along river banks. Tirtha, the word Tirtha means sacred. And in some languages, like in Tamil, it has come to mean water itself. So we have sacred lakes and water bodies, natural like Manasarovar, Artificial, like Pushkar in Rajasthan, we have step wells, temple tanks, and desilting is a duty, a dharma. Now, in the past, till the British came, the entire village in summer used to participate. The rich landlords provided the food, and the landless did the work. Maybe it's not fair, but whatever. It was done. The whole village got together to desilt the village tanks. And the silt that was removed was used for making the clay figures of the deity. For example, Ganesha during Ganesh Chaturthi and Durga during Durga Puja could only be made with the clay that was removed from the sacred lakes, the sacred tanks, rivers and so on. Unfortunately, that tradition has also gone today. They make it out of plaster of Paris. Uh, in Gujarat, we have the beautiful Rani Kivav step well. And that is a temple tank, which is a rainwater harvesting structure. These maintain the groundwater table and were the only water source during a drought. So even during drought, there was water in a village. Medicinal, they, they were medicinal because the Abhisheka water went into the tanks. They support a variety of life forms and are still maintained by temples. This tradition goes back to the Indus Valley civilization. And I genuinely believe that the so-called Great Bath was a temple tank. Just because the building, the temple, we cannot see, that doesn't mean it was not. Because we did not have the concept of Swimming pools to call it a great path. Then we come to the animals. And India's greatest contribution to world thought is the concept of ahimsa or non-violence. Thought, word and action. Killing animals has been prohibited since the Vedic period. You'll be surprised to know that the Rig Veda even disapproves of the utilization of milk, saying that if somebody takes away the milk of the calf, cut off their heads, oh Lord, it's terrible. And uh, Yajurveda says no person should kill animals who are helpful to all. By serving them, one should attain, obtain heaven. And they talk about Pashu Ahimsa, that is Ahimsa towards animals. The term Ahimsa is an important spiritual doctrine shared by Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. I think this is unique in the whole world. It is inspired by the belief that the supreme being lives in all living beings, human or animals. And therefore to hurt another 
is to open oneself to possible karmic repercussions. The idea is that if you hurt a bull, you will be reborn as a bull or as something worse which suffers. So ahimsa is non-violence in thought and action, first mentioned in the Rig Veda, the Taitriya Shaka of the Yajur Veda. And as I mentioned, it comes in the Yajur Veda in the Kapisthala Katha Samhita. The Chandogya Upanishad uses ahimsa as a code of conduct. It bars violence against all creatures. And the practitioner of ahimsa, says the Upanishad, escapes the cycle of rebirth. So the Hindu belief in the cycle of birth, death and rebirth requires Hindus to give all species equal respect and reverence. Himsa may result in their rebirth as an animal, bird or insect in another life, which nobody wants. So you have a lot of animals in an early uh, Indus Valley civilization's uh, seal. And as I mentioned earlier, the Rig Veda says the Yathudhana who fills himself with the flesh of man, he who fills himself with the flesh of horses or other animals, and he who steals the milk of the cow, Lord, cut off their heads with your flame. And the earliest reference, of course, to Pashu Ahimsa is in the Yajur Veda. The Atharva Veda says the earth was created, created for the enjoyments of Enjoyment of bipeds and quadrupeds, birds, animals, and all creatures, not humans alone. The Chandogya Upanishad bars violence against all creatures and says that the practitioner of Ahimsa is, will escape the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, the transmigration of the soul. The Tirukkural in Tamil, written around between 400 and 200 BC, dedicates an entire book, the Aram, Word Karam comes from Dharma to the virtues of compassion and ahimsa, vegetarianism, the non harming of animals, and not killing of all life forms. Uh, Tamil politicians constantly quote from the Tirukkural, but this is one thing they never quote, sadly. How are animals given sanctity? Some were gods like Ganesha, Vagdev. Vagdev is the tiger, which is the top predator and the prime ecological indicator. You have Vagdeo, Kuli Raya in Maharashtra and Karnataka. Some like Hanuman and the dog were man's friends. Therefore, primates, that is Hanuman and dogs, because dogs were the friend of Bhairava, Shiva. They were protected. Some were divine incarnations of Lord Vishnu. And many were the vehicles, Vahanas of the gods. <clears throat> some were deemed sacred because of their economical value. Some were part of social history, like Mahisha was the deity of ancient India, of the tribes of ancient India. And many kingdoms were named after him, like Mysore is Mahisha Ur and Mahishmati. And the buffalo was worshipped by the indigenous pastoral tribes of India. In my book, Book of Demons, I've shown how when the uh, goddess Durga, who was the goddess of the Dravidian agriculturists, came into conflict with the buffalo worshipping pastoral tribes. They represented it as a goddess or as a as the goddess killing the demon. And uh, that is how we have Mahishasura Mardini. But Mahisha is still the buffalo god of tribal India, Todas of South India, <clears throat> Gons and Maria Gons of Central India. The deity Mahasobha in Maharashtra, Mahesasur in Madhya Pradesh, even the Santals and all, all the tribes worship the buffalo god. By recognizing the divinity in animals, they had a unique position which helped produce, pr protect many species. The deification of se several animals led to their protection. A safeguard that was lost in the medieval colonial and post-colonial periods when many animals were described in ver as vermin and hunted to extinction. The hunting, the large scale, even the kings of ancient India were hunters. But large scale hunting, what is called canned hunting today, began with the Mughals. And then, of course, I don't have to tell you how the British 
helped by the Maharajas, destroyed the ecology and the wildlife of India. So there are three paths of marga to moksha, liberation, jnana, bhakti, and karma. So a human being can choose his path, so too can animals rise above the limitations of their birth. Several medieval saints, all the medieval saints of Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, preached kindness to animals and vegetarianism. And when Guru Jamboji died in Rajasthan, in the desert, he said he would be reborn in every black buck. Thanks to him, the Vishnois have never allowed anyone to kill any animals or cut green trees. Of course, you know the famous Salman Khan case, which is still hanging fire. Then we come to the mountains. Mountains, of course, are uh, visibly or inspiring, like Kailasa, Arunachala, and Thiruvannamalai, Thirumala, Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh, the Mukurti Peak in Narka for the Toda tribe, and so on. But why were the mountains, apart from the fact that they stood out and stood high, they hi highlight values and so on, but they were also preserved because they were comprehensive ecosystems in themselves and were also the watershed for, and for water, for the tanks and the lakes that were below. Temples were designed as symbols of Mount Meru and the most perfect recreation, recreation of Meru is the Hindu temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia with its five spires representing the five speak, speaks the seven walls, symbolic of the seven continents, and interspersed with moats that represent the oceans. So uh, the greatest example of Mount Meru is in Cambodia. And I would urge every Indian to visit Cambodia, Angkor Wat, to really understand concepts of Hinduism. Finally, we have sacred seeds, which are closely connected with uh, culture and seeds were a symbol of fertility, eternity and sustenance. Women chose the seeds to be preserved and the methods for their conservation and propagation. And on the say, day of sowing, women kept the, keep the seeds before the house deity and worship them. Now this was this is not done very interestingly for modern high yielding varieties anywhere in India. Before sowing begins, women worship the draft animals, the plow, and the other equipments used in sowing. They play an important, seeds play an important role in Indian rituals, such as the Navadhanya. So conserving seeds is conserving biodiversity, knowledge of the seed and its utilization, conserving culture and sustainability. The sacred ecology is a uniquely Indian concept. These ecological traditions are pan-Indian, and celebrated all over India. Our festivals are a celebration of the ecology. ecology. One example is harvest, celebrated all over India. Bhogi in Tamil Nadu, Pongal, Lohri in Punjab, Bihu in Assam and so on. And Sakranti everywhere else. Then we worship Deepavali. We worship the fire, Agni. And we worship flowers during Onam in Kerala and Bathukamma in Telangana. See how far apart all these places are. So to end, human beings have no dominion. We share the earth with animals and plants. Atharva Veda is a beautiful verse. O Mother Earth, you are the world for us and we are your children. Let us speak in one accord. Let us come together so that we live in peace and harmony. And let us be cordial and gracious in our relationship with other beings. Sarva Bhuta Hita, welfare of all beings, people, animals, and trees, is to is a, a motive, very important lesson given by our Vedas. The family of Mother Earth, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, must promote Sarva Bhuta Hita. Now we know that a forest and trees, fresh water, clean air disappear, so will all life. In order to be sustainable, Environmental policies and programs need to take values and ideals into account. They were there everywhere. Do you know in Europe, they had sacred gardens, they had sacred trees, which I have visited. 
and which people don't even know about why they are sacred. Shanti mantras are recited at the beginning and end of every ritual. And what is it? I'm not reading the Sanskrit. It says peace may be the meaning of the famous uh, Shanti Riksha, uh, Shanti Mantra, Undhyo Shanti means may peace re radiate in the whole sky and in the vast ethereal space. May peace reign all over the earth, in water, in herbs, and the forests. May peace flow over the whole universe. May peace be in the supreme being. May peace exist in all creation and peace alone. May peace flow into us. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. This peace can only come if we have our biodiversity, if we conserve the environment. Why do kings go? Why did kings go and why do countries go to war for more land? Countries with lots of land want more land because they want those lands which are green and capable of producing food. Well, Justice Vaidyanath in the court in Tamil Nadu in Chennai, while disposing of a writ petition, he said, religious beliefs are protective of human civilization and the environment. Our traditional values, our tradition and values passed down to us from our ancestors are not wrong beliefs. They are scientific, rational and logical. That is why they worship nature. Even now, many of them who follow our ancestral beliefs continue to do so as they have got abundant sanctity. Referring to people worshipping soil, fire, water, space and air, the Panchabhutas, the learned judge said it is not at all irrational. When nature gets sanctity, it will not be ruined. Thus, nature was protected in those days. However, in the name of rationality, Religious taboos were violated, the result of which we suffer these days. So I think that's a good way to end. For those who are interested you, in more information, you can go to our website, CPREECENVIS. ENVIS is the Environmental Information System of the Government of India, .nic .in, .nic .in. I have written three books on Sacred Animals of India, Hinduism and Nature and Sacred Plants of India, which talks more about what I've said. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to me to share my ideas with you. Namaskar. Thank you.